Good afternoon, and welcome to our virtual conversation about race and culture. My name is Kent Butler, and I'm the Interim Chief Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity Officer. I will facilitate for today's conversation, which I hope to be a time to candidly talk about life and shared experiences. This space is for, to share thoughts, provide comfort and support, and to be there for each other. And though we want to listen, we will also try to be responsive and entertain questions. I'd like to first introduce listeners and the other voices you'll be hearing from during the 90 minutes. Alexander Cartwright, our university president, Edwana Andrews, Interim Assistant Vice President for Community Support Services, Carl Metzger, Chief of the UCF Police Department, Justin Andrade, President of the Pride Faculty and Staff Association, Michael Johnson, our Interim Provost and Vice President, Cindy Muniz, Director of the HSI Culture and Partnerships, Courtney Hand, President of the Black Faculty Staff Association, Fernando Rivera, Professor of Sociology, and Christina Lawrence, UCF graduate student. I know there are many who would like to participate and we will work to be equitable with the time to allow voices to be heard. Please be thoughtful and respectful with your comments. And we ask that you only take two to three minutes each to share them. Unfortunately, I will have to interrupt at that time if necessary, because we want to hear and acknowledge every person that's in the room. We must acknowledge that events such as these are being targeted by hateful individuals spewing racist, biased, and crude remarks, and we hope not to be interrupted, but we'll deal with that if it should be. To enjoy listening and watching on Zoom, if, to everyone listening and, and watching on Zoom, please use the raise hand feature to share your story or remarks. We, work, we will work with you to turn your camera on and your microphone. We will hear from individuals in the order in which their hands were raised. On Zoom, there is also a question and answer feature at the bottom. Please use the question and answer to ask questions and we'll, we'll share them with the, list, the listeners. You can also designate who the question is for. You'll also note an upvote option. So if there's, if you see someone has already asked a question you are interested in, upvote it. We will give preference to the upvoted vote questions followed by questions in order to ask. There may be some more straightforward granular questions that may be passed over and answered in the question and answer window. You will find these in the answer tab. We are simulcasting right now, US, UCF US, YouTube channel. If any attendees are hearing from colleagues having trouble with Zoom, please direct them to that location. You can also find the direct YouTube link at events.ucf.edu. Before we move on, I would like for us to unite and observe eight seconds of silence in recognition of the eight minutes George Floyd endured having his neck kneeled upon. Thank you. President Cartwright, would you like to give some opening remarks before we open up the floor? Thank you, uh, Dr. Butler. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Bartlett and I had planned this webinar uh, actually over the weekend on Sunday, and this was uh, intended to be something where we get together and we open up and, and hear from all of you um, to hear the dialogue about what your experiences have been here, uh, to understand what you're going through uh, right now. Um, and we appreciate that you're willing to be part of this and to help us to have a critical conversation about the university's future and the institution that we want to become. Much has happened since Sunday. And to say 
people are struggling right now is a grave uh, understatement. So many in our community and across the world are anguished because of horrific murders and the racial injustice that's taking place in our country. It is devastating to see so many people in pain. And as I said earlier this week, I, I know that words are not enough. I know that you want and are demanding action. For those who attended the town hall uh, for students yesterday, um, we said that we want to hear from you and we truly mean that. Uh, we need to redouble our efforts so that our students, faculty and staff um, know that it's not enough to uh, be disgusted by racist or discriminatory behavior, uh, but we need to speak out against it. Uh, UC, UCF has a fair and transparent process uh, in place to help you do that, our integrity line, and we want you to use it. As, as we've said in the joint statement yesterday from me, the Pro Provost Johnson and Dr. Butler, we find the tweets uh, from Associate Professor Charles Nagy abhorrent. Although everyone has a right to their personal beliefs and uh, we cannot allow that to cross over into our classrooms or into our workplace if it hurts people. Because of the allegations and your stories that have come forward, we've launched an inquiry which is currently actively underway. And I've said often that UCF, certainly I came here because of what I saw in UCF. And I'm deeply disturbed by all that is going on right now. And I know that we need to be better and we need to do better. And just Continuing the way that it has been in the past is not sufficient. What we need to be is a model for inclusive excellence for the rest of the nation. To be a place that welcomes and supports people of every background, every creed, every color, every religion, every sexual orientation. Strength comes from our diversity. It makes us smarter. It makes us more compassionate and it makes us more human. And today is an opportunity for us to hear each other's stories and the ways that we can be a more united and inclusive campus. And we're here to listen. Thank you, Dr. Butler. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Our first speaker is, is Ms. Tiffany Tanaka Cooper. Hi, yes. Um, my name is Tiffany Tanaka Cooper. I'm an English major and I'm fall of 2020. Um, my comment is in regards to Professor Charles Nagy. Um, as a Black and Asian student that attends UCF, I found his Twitter account and comments very offensive to me, especially his um, belief in the mythical uh, minority putting against Asians and African Americans against each other. My question though is he has stated on his Twitter account multiple times that he is protected by the First Amendment and that nothing can happen to him. And my question is, is like, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous, but um, how far is too far? And if students on campus feel uncomfortable with him uh, teaching, what steps or what avenues does UCF have if his Twitter account is protected by the First Amendment? Is he allowed to still be in the classroom and teach class, um, classes with minority students in them? Thank you. Thank you. And so I wanna honor the purpose behind us having this conversation is that we wanted to really hear from individuals with regards to their concerns and their thoughts, how they were healing throughout this. But in reference to that, I would like to have one of the panelists um, speak to that um, in the way that they would like to, I think Mike Johnson will, will take that on. I'll certainly try. There's, there's no easy answer to this, um, but, but let me, the, because the answer I'm going to give you um, is going to explain why things take longer than people would like. So, First, 
UCF is a public institution. It means we're viewed by the law as though we're an arm of the government. And that means that all constitutional rights have to be upheld by us as a university. So anything I say or you say in your life as a private citizen is protected by law. Um, and the university couldn't act against me, couldn't act against you, couldn't act against um, Professor Nagy or anyone else based on comments in their personal lives, even if offensive, even if terrible. Um, private companies can in fact fire people for saying things that are offensive and that harm the reputation of the company. Public universities can't. And that's a, that's a very hard thing for people to hear. On the other hand, um, we have every ability to um, react to the behavior, the actions of our faculty and staff, all of our employees in the course of their work. So in the workplace, in interactions with students or colleagues, in the classroom, if a faculty member um, is offensive, discriminatory, uh, behaves improperly, bullies, we have capacity to act. And that's in fact, almost the most important thing I need you to hear today. A difficulty for us, and this really, this really saddens me, is that people don't very often come forward. People say they've come forward, and when we dig, we cannot find indications of it. So I fear what often happens is that people talk to one another, or there is a comment and an evaluation at the end of course, but when something is really the kind of behavior, so end of course evaluations are, are intended to help the faculty members improve what they do. If somebody's behavior is beyond uh, reason, if it's discriminatory, if they rant or scream in the classroom, if they treat people differentially and discriminatorily, we need to hear it. And I really hope that when that occurs, um, You'll, get to, you'll, you'll use the right channel. The best channel at UCF is the integrity line. Nothing that comes to the integrity line is ignored. Um, and I guess, I guess I would say that one of my hopes for this moment is that we might turn a corner where in fact we do hear of misbehavior so that we can in fact look into it and take action. And, and, then, and then I have to say it will never be immediate because there's a right of due process for employees at a university, just like every public entity. We have, it's not just tenure, it's not just faculty. We have to follow a process which, in which we figure out what the facts are and evaluate them, look at accusations, give people a chance to defend and then make a decision. And I say all that, you know, I, I both think it's right but I also would like you all to hear that that means nothing ever happens overnight when it's a serious matter. And thank you, Dr. Butler, for the chance to, to comment on this. Thank you. And so just to reiterate, what we really would like to have is not us really responding to questions. We really wanna hear from you and really to try to work with you and to support you and what you're going through in this, in this pandemic and in the, events that have occurred over the past couple of weeks. And next we have Dylan Mongo. And to those who are going to be coming on, you can show your, your screen. Um, this is not a, uh, a way to tell you that before, but feel free to share your screen. Good afternoon, sorry about that. Uh, I'm a junior uh, in health sciences. Um, hope you guys are all doing all right this afternoon. Um, I just uh, wanted to speak and say uh, not necessarily just on um, Dr. Nagy's comments, but the, the demeanor on the whole of the, of the UCF community, or the administration in particular. Um, I think what I want as a student, and a lot of us do, is accountability and transparency uh, from you. Um, 
you know, I, I understand that there is a process. Um, you have to do your investigation, but, you know, uh, we would like transparency and authenticity as well. Um, you know, in response, uh, Mr. Ken Butler, in your video, um, you know, you asked us for uh, the answers to the questions, um, you know, uh, sorry about that. Um, you asked us to come with solutions, but um, it's also on you in your position of power to call on, you know, BSU, Black Student Union, MSA, and those kind of uh, uh, organizations who can speak um, from a much better place uh, than a lot of us. And just um, in conclusion, to respond to the um, overnightness, uh, not overnightness, sorry, uh, when you said we can't solve this overnight, this issue, this issue with Dr. Nagy has been going on for years. So, you know, it's been known, it's just the, the process, the system needs to be uh, overhauled. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The next person that we have coming forward is Delise Allen Polidor. Now, I apologize if I said it incorrectly. So Delise Allen Polidor. Hi, so I'm an incoming freshman for this fall. And I think pretty much everyone's regard when coming on this was just um, Professor Negi's like comments on his Twitter. And it really is like, we're not giving direct or getting direct answers from everyone. And I think that's kind of like everyone's main like issue right now, because I actually had him scheduled for um, my general psychology class this summer. And now that he's made these comments, I'm like, okay, so why is he still in our psychology, um, like our psychology field and no one's taking action. And I see in the comments and everyone's saying there's multiple complaints against him. And yet he's still like been teaching at the university for several years. So I think that's my main concern as a psychology major. And I just wanna know what, is actually going to be done instead of just saying, um, like, we'll get to it. Yes, um, I'll take that on and just to say that um, the wheels are in motion in terms of what needs to happen with regards to that. And so, Students have a right to take a class or not take a class as well. And so when we hear from students about how their concerns are, with what's, what they're about to go into, what we're going to do is act upon that and, and really help to support you all in that. And so believe that, that by the time you get onto campus as a freshman, it will have been dealt with. And I, I can't give you any other reassurance than that. You don't know me. You don't know how to trust me. But just know that I'm here for your safety. And in my position, I'm going to do my best to make sure that when you are here and when you all are in classes, that you, you feel that you belong here at UCF. Any other, any other thoughts, Dailies? No, that's all I wanted to answer. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Samantha Ramos. Hello, is this on? Yes. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Adrian Lee, and I'm coming as a student, but also as a president of the Asian Pacific American Coalition, which was an RSO began in 2005 by a group of Asian American students who saw a lack of leadership, who saw a lack of care from our school of Asian American issues. And I am speaking out um, with my voice trembling, not out of fear, but out of anger that our community has gone largely unseen from this institution for a very long time. And it is now taking this space, this space that should be used to promote the black voices and black communities amidst all the turmoil and injustices that their community has faced, not only within schools, but within nationwide, nationwide institutions. And that this conversation again is only happening now with all the attention being turned to our university there are, there are numerous news sources such as BuzzFeed, New York Times, NBC News that has reported on the, the presence of Charles Nagy within our institution to criticize our institution. And I think rightfully so. You asked us to be respectful and I'm doing my best, but I think we must also acknowledge the deep upsets and frustrations from our students when we have been speaking out against these kinds of issues and especially of professors like Charles Nagy for a very long time. You made a comment that students have not been reporting. And I made a comment in that question and answer box as well that students do not promote because they don't believe in the efficacy of reporting. And so we must take that as an institution to analyze the ways that our, our faculty has failed to promote its mission of diversity and inclusion by not allowing students to come forward in confidence and in trust that there will be some action done. The mission of UCF with a body of 70,000 students from all sorts of backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds as well and racial identities and sexual identities. It is unacceptable that we continue to promote blanket diversity and blanket diversity as in, again, the performative actions to say that we are an inclusive institution when these issues are still very prevalent and have been outspoken against by student activists for a very long time. So you are asking for statements from students, not just questions. This is my statement and this is my challenge. I wanna see black, Asian and Latin departments specifically funded by students, by, by our student government to promote more cultural funding, to prom more, promote more educational resources and funding resources into our cultural organizations as we, as we have been speaking out against this for a very long time. I no longer want to hear, I no longer want to hear things like we stand with our students when you have been actively suppressing students and our student government itself as well. Last year, there were 70 vacant, there were 70 vacant seats, unfortunately. And we took that and we didn't do anything about it. Instead, we just continued to just merely ask our students to, to run within their colleges. And we did it a very poor job of reaching out to the organizations and the communities of the most audiences and of the most members, which includes our cultural organizations. So this is my statement again, that we need to see more solidarity within our communities, but we also need to see more acknowledgement and recognition of the different racial groups. Again, blanket diversity is not diversity. It is not a celebration of diversity. In fact, it is a suppression of diversity. So that is my statement. And I hope you guys can take this into consideration. Thank you. And Adrian, I'll tell you, I'll be in touch with you. Next we have Samantha. Samantha Ramos. Hi everyone, my name is Samantha Ramos. I am a success coach, so I'm actually a staff member. Um, I just have two comments to make, or rather two things to say. I love your feedback. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, I worked at Valencia for two years um, as an advisor, as a program advisor, and now I am a success coach and I've been here for six months. I would really like to see some sort of mandatory diversity training and workshops and inclusion efforts for staff and faculty. And I know that there's always some contention around making something mandatory. You want people to go to these things because they want to. I know that you know, seed, exi seed exists and there's always workshops, but 
I've always been disappointed that between my work at Valencia and my work at UCF, there has never been any kind of any kind of mandatory effort to get people to understand the diverse population of students that we're working with, especially in Orlando. Um, I'm very passionate about this work. I'm happy to reach out to the diversity and inclusion office and work with them, but I just would like to hear from you all about what we're going to do with that moving forward for staff, faculty and staff. So that's my first um, question statement. <laughs> and then my second one is, I am not, I'm not a black person. I am a person of color. I'm Latina, but I have a lot of privilege with the way that I look. I'm very white passing. I'm not saying that um, to say that I'm feeling guilty or anything like that or have any kind of white savior complex, but I can only imagine how my um, black colleagues are feeling right now and the fact that they've been asked to just continue to work these past couple weeks, these past couple months um, with what's been happening with George Floyd and Ahmad and Brianna and multiple others, they've just been asked to go back to work and continue on with their jobs. And I recognize that if you're um, certain levels of staff or faculty, you can take a personal day or you can use your sick time, but some of us are new and we don't have sick time and we're saving that for if we need to go to the doctor's office um, and what, whatever we need it for. So I'm just saying that I really think it would be amazing if UCF made a formal day, a mental health day for everybody and gave them that time to, to grieve and to process what's happening because what's happening is not okay. And we're continuing on as if everything's okay and that we should just go on with our work as if nothing has happened. So I implore you all to please consider giving us some paid time off to really think about what we can be doing right now to support one another. Um, I know too that like there's a lot everybody can be doing at this time. Please, today was would have been Brianna's birthday. So please make phone calls on her behalf. Um, thank you all for doing this. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your heart. Appreciate it. Next we have Michael Garcia. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. I can hear you. Okay. I want to thank you all for uh, this opportunity. Uh, I am, my wife currently works at UCF. I'm a former uh, staff member with UCF. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Officer Carl, uh, Chief uh, Medzer, um, and quite a few other people with UCF. So again, thank you for this. And my question primarily is for um, uh, Chief Metzer. Um, regarding the hiring process. Um, some of you may know that my, my previous employment, I was a police officer in Los Angeles, and I've dealt with um, a lot of injustices just from the city of Los Angeles. I'm sorry, my screen is black or dark. Um, but I wanna know, because I'm working with individuals right now on creating statewide legislation that regulates um, the hiring process and the training procedures for um, law enforcement officers. Um, you know, as a previous officer, I believe that there are um, minimal um, regulations in place when it comes to screening officers for biases, um, which I think leads to a lot of um, the issues. Um, I categorize the hiring process or at least people that join law enforcement into three categories. Um, the first one are individuals that want to serve, they want to give back to the community. They, they wanna do good and, and protect and serve. Then you have individuals that join because they wanna make money, um, good pension, good retirement, things along those lines. And then uh, uh, the third one are individuals who um, are seeking power. You know, They may have been bullied or a um, number of different things that have, could have taken place during their, their rearing, but you know they use it as a power source. And so I wanna ask, um, are there any things or, or steps in place to regulate hiring, um, I'm not I'm not aware of any issues with UCF police, by the way. But I just want to make sure we don't end up on the news because there's an issue with UCF or or things along those lines. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, and as I said earlier, we'll we'll try to 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 identify how to answer that for you. But we want to use this forum to kind of get people to talk about that. But the the sentiment behind you. Your thoughts are well taken. I'll have Chief maybe share a word or two with you 
Um, but then we'll move on to the next question. Yeah, absolutely. Michael, um, yeah, thank you for your questions and uh, good to see you again. Uh, we take the hiring process very seriously here at UCF. Uh, the state of Florida has a standards and training commission, and it regulates you know, how officers are hired, uh, what the standards are, and then there are training standards as well. All of the police academies, um, they've, been, they've grown longer. It takes about six months to get through a police academy. And then there is a field training program that takes you know, five to six months, uh, depending on the agency. Um, here at UCF, you know, we have a very stringent set of guidelines um, that we follow as far as the hiring process. And um, in response to what's going on, uh, we've developed a list of action items. And one of the actionable items that we're instituting is um, instituting uh, uh, part of the training and um, the questioning will be about bias. And, uh, and we're trying to determine exactly what best practices are around the country. And, uh, but we will institute that because that is important, especially at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Um, next up, we have Trinity Johnson. And as she's coming on, I will let you know that we're taking people on first come first serve basis in the way that they raise their hand. So um, please be patient with us. Um, hi, my name is Trinity. Uh, hi, just Trinity. for a little background, I received my bachelor's in psychology from Stetson University and a master's of public health from Rollins College. I grew up in lower Alabama and I'm used to being black in a white space, but right now I'm tired. I chose the University of Central Florida over, over FAMU for a doctorate program and your responses of right now are making me truly regret this decision. I'm a PhD student in the Integrative Anthropological Science Program. Waiting and being patient is precisely how we are where we are right now. As a diversity, equity, and inclusion expert who taught in Pine Hills um, and in Paramore where UCF is gentrifying right now, having someone on payroll like this is completely antithetical to what it means to be anti-racist. As a public health expert, my community is hurting because of an already racist system that has pathologized them rather than addressing the racist system that exists. For example, COVID and how, disproportion how it disproportionately affects black communities. Right now, we have to choose between risking our lives to protest or risking our lives by doing nothing. Right now, it hurts to know that the university that I chose, that I'm doing research for specifically related to how systematic racism affects adverse health outcomes for black women, specifically pregnant black women, it hurts. Frankly, I'm tired of being asked to be patient when it comes to Black people and Black liberation and how we are represented in white and historically white institutions. Additionally, why did it take this long to recognize that Black lives matter when Trayvon Martin was killed in 2012, 30 minutes down the road? In regards to Dr. Negi, can we please consider how many potential black psychologists have been deterred from the field as a result of experiencing racism in a psychology classroom? Would they feel like psychology that is already historically racist and dismissive? We are tired. Thank you for sharing, Trenton. Appreciate it. I'll be in touch. Hope Wade is next. You should be able to see me now. <laughs> I was having technical difficulties. Great. Um, so first and foremost, I know many of you um, on this on this screen right now. Um, uh, Chief Metzger, I worked with you uh, for two years in the Administration and Finance VP office. Um, Dr. Butler, I worked with you in the College of Education when it was called the College of Education in um, the Technology and Facilities office. Um, when I was a student employee, I have done my bachelor's degree at this university. I have done my master's degree at this university. I work for this university. I have interacted with 
nearly everyone on this screen. And it is so disappointing to hear and to know that this man, <laughs> this man um, is going to probably get a slap on the wrist because he didn't say he spoke for all of UCF um, and that we have students who have publicly displayed racist comments, vile comments, um, who are going to be coming into this university and no announcement or decision has been made on those students. And um, I now work in first year experience and I have listened to my staff, um, my student staff who have shared that um, they're, they're uncomfortable with these with knowing that these students are coming to orientation and they have to interact with these students because no decision has been made on their admission um, and no statement has been made on their admission and it is so disappointing to hear my staff in the past three days cry and have not felt supported by a university that i love that i invested in like, I moved to Florida. I'm from Tennessee. I moved to Florida and I said, I love this place. And this is how we're treated. This is like blanket responses. And to be completely frank, BS responses from administrators instead of decision and action. Is this what we're going to do? That is my question to all of you. Is this what we're going to do when you go, when you click off of this forum and you go back to your personal moment, I want you to ask yourself, is this what we're going to do? Is this the precedent that we are going to set forth? Because what's going to happen is this gentleman, I'm not even going to call him a gentleman, this person is going to be told that he is validated in his comments by not taking action. And then you're gonna say, oh, well, we need to have more evidence. And then what's gonna happen is he's gonna bargain. He's like, well, you didn't fire me for this. You didn't fire me for that. You didn't fire me from that. Oh, but now you're gonna fire me? He, I was here seven years ago and nobody likes this man. I wasn't even a psychology student. But nobody liked this man. Everyone said that he was like terrible and racist and they felt uncomfortable in his class. And that's seven years ago. Well, thank you, Hope. We really appreciate your, your sentiments and it really has resonated. And I, I wish I was there with you to be able to support you right now. In this COVID time, we can't do that. But um, please, thank you for sharing your voices. Everyone who's talked so far, thank you for bringing your experiences to us and really know that we know what's going on. Thank you. Uh, um, Dr. Oh, Butler, yes, Dr. Butler, can I share something? Um, first of all, Hope, thank you. Thank you for your bravery um, as a staff member putting yourself out there. <laughs> I truly appreciate it. Um, please know we hear you. We hear students. Tears will not be in vain, okay? Tears. Not Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Colin Crabtree. Hi there. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So thank you for this time. Um, I wanted to touch on some things about Charles Negi as well. I know one of our previous speakers did uh, touch on this about the um, kind of, you know, people filing complaints and stuff. And then I believe one of the panelists mentioned about not really having any complaints or, um, you know, mentioning the student evaluation at the end of the semester, being able to share your thoughts and everything. One of the issues though, is that even with that being anonymous and everything, a lot of these students who are impacted by his racist words and by the things he said are people who are in minority groups people of color, black people, queer people. And those are people that are so not used to having safe spaces. Um, nowadays, you know, that phrase safe space has been thrown out a lot more. There's, you know, little stickers thrown up on walls of restaurants or buildings. This is a safe space. But for 
many moments in our lives, that was not something that was guaranteed. And even to this day, some place may claim to be a safe space, but um, if they're really not gonna be holding accountability and taking action, how safe are they for us? So that safety is something that's not usually very guaranteed. And those people that are impacted by this, even when they're told, you know, this is anonymous, this is whatever, it can still be very really fearful to speak out. So at the end of the day, you know, students have that responsibility to, you know, share their stories and everything, but it can't just fall on us. There needs to be more accountability within the faculty and the administration as well. So be making sure the professors are doing their due diligence, teaching what is part of the actual curriculum and not just you know, throwing in their opinions, throwing in remarks that are gonna make students uncomfortable, whether it be, I don't know, more evaluations of the faculty themselves, whether it be getting approval over their curriculum before they teach, there just needs to be more accountability on that front and it needs to come from the faculty as well. You have said before, we're all in this together and that is true. And that means that we both need to put in our work to make sure that teachers are teaching and not spewing racist remarks and um, you know putting students in really uncomfortable situations so I mean thank you for you know like reminding students that they can use those forms and everything to uh, say what they need to say but we also need our administration to take a better look at what is happening with our classrooms and maybe I don't know what this exact solution would be if it's having people come in and, you know, like review a lecture or if it's, uh, you know, just like having teachers, I guess, like submit things beforehand or just, especially in classes like psychology and things that get into social dynamics and go into things like racism and stuff. It's really important that what is being taught is accurate and true. So that's basically what I wanted to say on that front. Um, let me just double check. Yeah, I think that's basically what I wanted to touch on. Um, I just really hope that the administration can do more on their side as well to make sure that, you know, teachers aren't just having free reign in the classroom to say what they want to say, that there's somebody who's watching and making sure that what they're teaching is true and valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Colin. Is there anyone, Fernando, perhaps, would you like to respond to that? Uh, sure, uh, thanks, thanks for, putting that out there calling and obviously I'm a faculty member so you know we'll do our due diligence and as, as, as Provost uh, Johnson said you know we have different processes and all sorts of things but we'll, we'll continue to listen and, 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 and bring those uh, those concerns that you have to the faculty and to the administration so thank you. Next we have Alexandro Wilson. Watson I'm sorry. Hi there. Uh, my name is Alejandro Watson. Um, I go by Dro. Uh, I, <clears throat> sorry, I am um, black. I am um, multiracial. I am um, a transgender woman um, in in this school. Uh, I am currently doing my master's in film. I teach, um, and uh, sorry. <laughs> I work extremely hard to make sure that my students are okay and, and make sure that my, my class is a safe space. And I'm doing that for the peanuts that you guys pay the MFA uh, grad students. <clears throat> and the fact that I put in, put in so much work as a student is not fair. Is not fair. It's not. So excuse me if what you guys are saying falls on deaf ears with regards to me. It's not enough. I work so hard to make sure that my students are okay and safe and not just in class during COVID. I made sure I had students sending me messages that they had to go back to their countries and whatever. And, and uh, I'm sorry. I, I used to really love UCF. UCF is so important to me. I'm sorry. But it's hard to tell people to come here. It's hard for me. It's hard to tell people to come here. 
the way I've been treated by by people and, and, and some of the classes I've been in as a black person, as a transgender woman, as a queer person in general, as a multiracial person, as someone with mental health issues, the way that, that people are so insensitive in their comments and so incensed when they are called out is ridiculous. I try my best to make sure that people are safe and, and feel like they can come to me in my classroom. And I'm a student. And I'm a student without training. That's, that's, all, that's all I got. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. Thank you. And you're, you're elegant eloquent in what you're sharing with us. And I know that, you know, there's a need, there's a need for us to have a different avenues to reach out to people. And, and it's unfortunate that, that you're having this issue. And I just wish that I could just be there for you. And I know that Edwana wants to speak out right now. And so I'm gonna give her an opportunity to reach out to you, but please reach out to me after this is over, please. Okay. Hey, Drew, it's, um... It's good to see you. I'm sorry it's such an unfortunate circumstance, but I remember meeting you in Pride Commons and how you had such great love for this institution. And so I, I, want, I want to work with you. I want to help restore your pride and your joy in your institution. And so I will certainly be reaching out to you. I miss you. You gave the best hugs. <laughs> we hear you. We hear you. Okay. Before we move on, Kent, I'd also like to say, Dro, first, I pinned this video because I want it to look like I'm looking at you. Um, but I hope you know that as part of this um, forum, um, PFSA understands the importance of allyship and we continue to uplift our trans black brothers and sisters and our queer people of color through the way that we um, create the makeup of our executive council to ensure that there's accurate representation of the intersections of the LGBTQ plus community. And more than anything, I will promise you that I will continue to charge forward with the conversations that are so important surrounding allyship, true allyship, and utilizing that to continue to uplift, uplift those voices. So thank you for sharing your story, for outing yourself. We appreciate you. Yeah, I, I, I wanna be, I know my time is up. I wanna be very clear. Um, I need to get a lot from you guys. I, I, I really do um, before I can love this university again. I, 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 I appreciate reaching out. I appreciate you guys doing this, but this is not enough for me, um, it really isn't. Um, and, and, and maybe in talking, uh, things will change, but I, I just, I want you guys to know that this is not me letting you off the hook and, and this really is not enough. Um, okay. And we understand that because I'm a counselor by training. What we do is face-to-face, -face, so I get it. And that's, and, and, and we'll make this right. We'll make this right, and I'm sorry. That this is the format, but it's COVID and the pandemic is doing for us right now. So um, everything, this is why we're having this because we need to know how to get there. We all come from different life experiences and, and that is the piece that this, your voice, the voices that we're hearing, the, the messages that we're seeing are helping us to recognize what will help UCF get it right. We're listening. Thank you. And Dro, keep holding us accountable. Okay, I will, I promise. Next up, I believe, I'm not seeing it. I thought I saw Gabby, Gabby Rodriguez. Is that what I, what I have? We have Kaya Peters. Yeah, you're it's, muted. Yeah, hi, it's Kaya. Hi. Kaya, I'm sorry. 
Um, no problem. Um, first, I just, I don't know. Um, I'm Kaya Peters. I'm a proud graduate of the Florida Agricultural Mechanical University. Um, and I'm currently in the physical therapy program here at UCF. To no discredit of my teachers, they are one of the best programs here at UCF. They are very understanding. They are, are very communicative with, communicative with their students. But one of the things that I really miss about FAMU is that there were a lot of people that looked like me. And there is no discredit to my teachers, but it is hard when I look on the hallways of class pictures of every class that has happened before me. And there's only like five black women who have ever graduated from this program. It's hard because even though I believe that I don't have it as harder or have experience as much as other, it's hard because you feel it. It's hard because you know how people feel coming into white spaces and feeling like they're not heard or they're poked at or looks like an anomaly. It's hard when there's not, you feel like sometimes there's not a space for you. I question what UCF is doing to help engage minorities on this campus. What are they doing to help put themselves and enhancing community action and involvement in communities, especially those with low socioeconomic status? Like, what are they doing to helping those that the university, who was one of the biggest undergrad universities could do to help, really, to let those students and those communities know that they're there from them and that they could be accepted on this campus. I would like to know, I've never had any interaction with UCF's police, but I would like to know, are they having conversations with the Black Student Union? Are they going to those places to tell them what they're doing and hearing their their complaints about our safety and believing that they're truly here to protect us on campus. I would like to know these things. I would like to know that we can have more continued panels about diversity on campus, just not right now. There should be more, there should be more. I wish there was a place where minority healthcare students can come because healthcare and minorities, there is a ton of um disparities. And I wish there was a communication for us to connect to help promote these issues on our campus and have our teachers support us in that. And so I am not saying that there, there's, not, there's not teachers that care. I know there are because I know my teachers care. I just would like to see more. I would like to see more diversity in the administration on the board. I just want to know that there's someone that has a voice that represents a little corner or a percentage, percentage of us on campus. I just really hope that from this, the administration can really evaluate how they look to engaging in the community and, um, and their students. And I don't know, I just, I hope, I would like to say to those who are not people of color who express their same anger and frustration with how it's going. I really ask that if you know someone, ask them how they're doing. Call on them, let them know that you're there. They may not wanna talk, but just let them know that you're gonna be there. Please do your best and educate yourselves on these issues. Read a book, there's podcasts, there are things, and we really do need everyone that can help us to make a difference. So please, if you are there, if you're trying to help, just try to understand, to reach out a hand. And I just really hope that it will all get better. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you so much. Dr. Butler. Yes. Can I say something, Kaya? Um, thank you so much. Um, we need to do more. Um, I mean, it's, it's when I hear what you're all talking about, the need for us to look at our systems, the need for us to think about how is the process working? Clearly it's not if you feel that, that your complaints in the past have not meant anything. How do we ensure that you can actually put forward a, com a complaint about our faculty in a way that you feel heard and that you don't feel that it's going to hurt you in any way. 
we have to fix the process. We need to work through that. And I need your help in fixing that process. There were some great suggestions earlier, cultural training, multicultural, inclusive excellence training. We need more of it. We're an institution that I truly want us to commit that we can be exceptional at this. And we have to put in place all of the tools you're talking about. Some of these things are not natural for people. They, they, don't, they don't have the background. They haven't had your lived, your, experience, your life experiences. And so how do, we, how do we go about and create an environment where people can appreciate and understand everything that people bring to this institution? I don't want people like Drew feeling they don't belong here. You belong here. You should be here. The passion that you spoke with about how you work with students, how you work with others, and how much you care about people, that's what we need more of. And I need to make sure that every day that I'm here, I'm fighting for you to have that right, for you to be able to feel this is your home. You should never feel differently. Now, do we have challenges in our processes? Do we have to go through a process to look at, at you know, what's happening with a faculty when we have a complaint? Yes, and we're not alone in that. But we're going to continue to do everything we can. And we will continue to push forward as long as we also have your support in that too. We need you to hold us, Edwana said this earlier, we need you to hold us accountable. You know, for me to come here to this institution that I saw so much here, right? I remember um, just, I haven't been able to see much of the campus at all, right? I've only seen just a few things. Um, to see the mural to the Pulse nightclub shooting. I thought, I felt so good that day because I thought I was at an institution that cared about its people. And it's absolutely heartbreaking today to hear this because I'm very concerned that we don't. And I, I don't want you to conf conflate the two that, you know, because of our lack of what we're doing with a particular case means that we don't care. Sometimes we have to go through a process as frustrating as that process is to me, as frustrating as that process may, is to you. But we need to do it appropriately. And I, I just don't want any of you to think you shouldn't be here. I want you to be here. I want to engage. I want to be with you. I want you to know that this is your institution. It is not my institution. It is your institution. You're the students, you're the faculty, you're the staff, right? And we want you to feel that this is your institution. And let's all figure out a way to make that happen. I, I, I don't have the answers, okay? There's deep seated, deep rooted challenges, systemic challenges that we're gonna have to fight. And we're gonna fight them. We're gonna fight them together. And I think as long as we're all on that same, as long as we keep pushing, we can at least make the changes here at UCF. We may not be able to make the changes globally. We may not be able to affect this whole country, but let's affect the part of the country that we can and the part that we all live in. And thank you so much for all of you for being so open and for, for sharing what's actually going on in your minds and your hearts. And I appreciate that. And Kaya, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, President Cartwright. Next, we have Gabby Rodriguez. Hello. Can you all see me and hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabriela Rodriguez. I'm a Latina student studying engineering at UCF. First off, I want to thank all the panelists, not only for today, but for yesterday for taking this time and really just giving us the opportunity to speak. My statement is more so a conversation starter to our panelists. How can us students aid our higher administration, our faculty and our staff to create a more inclusive environment at UCF? 
I know it's not just on you. It's also on us as students. It's also on us on people to learn and educate. So how can we help you to make this a more safe, inclusive place for all the students at UCF? I'll, I'll start with that. Um, thanks for that, Gabby. And I, I hope people don't think that that's a ringer question, but um, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is under the microscope right now because of, of all of the things that are going on. But I started in July of last year to try to start making changes, right? I put out a campus climate survey to everyone on campus to, to find out what's going on. That, those results will be given to the community on July 15th. Part of that strategic planning is coming from that in terms of how we can move forward in terms of where the university needs to go. So yesterday when I said patience and time, I knew that there were things that were happening in the background that we're trying our best to get there. I know that I sit in spaces with people who, who really feel what other people are feeling. Um, and I'm not trying to say this because I'm being the spokesperson for UCF, the spokesperson for my life. And so I'm trying to get people to help me to make the changes that are there. Because when there's a singular voice, sometimes it doesn't necessarily make the things happen. But when there's, so there's something about systemic racism that really works as good nerve for me is that it loves us being divisive and fighting one another. Because when it does that, the machine that it is stays afloat without any worries. So when I invite people to come and support me and help me, and tell me what they are, it's because I can't think of everything. I don't have the capacity to have what other people's life experiences have been in order for me to try to do the right thing for them. So when I'm hearing voices and people are telling me this and telling me that, it supports my narrative and it informs me because if I don't hear it and I don't know it, I got an email at 11.55 Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, evening. I can't even think right now. It's been such a crazy week. But 11.55 PM, I get an email. First time I ever heard of Charles Nagy in this fashion. First time. I started July 1st in this role. I can't know all the things that happened years before. It wasn't my space or my time to know those things then. But I found out Wednesday. And then my immediate reaction is that I'm supposed to do all I can to get rid of Charles Nagy. I don't have that control or that power, but I can hear you and I can see what your thoughts are and I can see what your responses are to him being here and I can fight for you. And that's what I promise to do. I promise to fight for anybody who feels as though they can't survive on this campus. They can't feel like they're at home on this campus. I've been doing this work for a while. And I love what I do, but it's draining and it's exhausting. And when people are fighting me for the same thing I'm fighting for them for, it doesn't help the narrative. And so I thank you for what you're bringing. And, uh, and just know that I'm here to support you. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion is making changes in how we operate. Because we didn't scale when the university scaled. But we're looking for resources and all those other things to make that happen. So when I truly say to people to come see me, come talk to me, come help me, it's because it, it informs me and it helps me to do the work that I need to do. So I appreciate what you bring to the table. Thank you. I also have one last thing to say as an idea and an option for all the panelists. I believe that it shouldn't take a racial injustice to happen to have these kinds of conversations. I believe we should continue these conversations in town halls but not have them just represented by cultural groups, but supported by UCF as a whole. I wasn't aware of the Black Student Union conversations they held yesterday. Those are things that I think should be sent to all of UCF students and have UCF support these conversations so we can continue educating as students, as faculty, and as staff. But thank you so much for your time and just for listening. And people need to hear you say that. So thank you, I yeah. appreciate it. And, and, uh, and Gabby. I, 
Another thing that you can do is when you do see things is to step in and to share it with your, with your peers. Share it with those who want to be educated that are interested in the topic because that's how we are able to share the message. You know we're a large campus. And so we need your help. We need you to step in, not lean in because we don't want you to fall. We want you to step in and be firmly planted. And so we need you to step in and help with all of this. You know, President Cartwright, he, he shared that, that he is listening um, and we're all listening and we're ready for action. And so we need you to step in. So if you got some good shoes, girl, put them on and let's go. Thank you so much. So I just want to say that we have quite a few people in the queue. And so we're going to try to really be cognizant of time because we want to hear from everyone that we can. And this, con this conversation will continue. Gabby, thank you. This wasn't going to be a one-stop shop on this. We are looking to do this as much as possible. Um, it would be more convenient on, a, on campus, but we're going to try to do it through this venue as often as we can. And so Andrew Like, the floor is yours. Um, ahead, Andrew. Yes. OK, so. So you can anyone hear me? All right, so I've been at UCF for the past three years and after hearing all this, it's really an eye opener of what's going on. And it not only shocks me, but it kind of, for the past two semesters, I was a student under Dr. Morton and he teaches history, American history, 2020, 2010. And under that class, I was, it, I, it really opened my eyes to how a lot of the stuff that happened in the past is still going on today. And one of the questions I would like to ask in regards to this is, how are we going to continue this fight? And how are we going to ultimately win this, first of all? And second of all, how are we going to make sure that the actions that happened in the past that resulted in suppression and violence how are we going to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen again? So I cannot give you a guarantee that things are not going to happen again, because each individual who comes to this place has their way of doing things in terms of acting out and hurting people. I denounce racism. I fight against racism. And, but there are people, as you see, as you look across the globe, who are doing their best to hurt others and to, to treat others in a way that they would not treat themselves. And so it's really, really, truly important that when we see something, we got to kind of act out. I need my allies. I need people who see someone doing something to support me when we're making the attempt to stop those things from happening. And I'm just going to turn it over to the panel anyone there who would like to speak out because I think that it's a, it's a joint effort. When we, when we talk about anti-racists, we're really talking about somebody doing some deep soul searching into what were the stories that were told them in their lifetime that made them see people differently than the people are, right? How do we get people to recognize that I'm an individual, I'm not a black, community. I'm an individual within the Black community, within the United States of America as a whole. And if you can treat me in that manner as an individual, like you want to be treated for all the things I bring to the table, I shouldn't have to fear walking down the street every day of my life because I'm a Black man. No one should have to do that, whether they are from the gay community or from the Jewish community or from any other community. And I don't want to start naming things off because I don't want to be told later that I didn't name someone. But the fact of the matter is there are people out there who are hurting because people are oppressing them. And so we're calling out privilege and we're calling out people who want to hold on to the power so that they cannot um, allow others to have access. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for access. And so I'm going to turn it over to my panel. Anyone would like to speak out on that? Dr. Butler, I'd just like to repeat some things that you told me, which was first, listen. And second, we have to have the difficult conversations. And I think maybe as a country and maybe as a university community, we haven't. And we have to 
And I'm trying, and that's my mission, right? My mission is to have difficult dialogue and I'm, I'm all about it. I've been having a lot of difficult dialogues with folks and, um, and I'm bringing them full steam ahead to the University of Central Florida. And not just dialogue, but action. And Andrew, what I would add is that we can only do this together. All of us have to commit to it. We have to create an environment where people feel that they are part of the community. And we can't accept uh, behavior uh, that is, you know, um, that creates a, a, an environment here at UCF that people don't feel that, that they're welcome. And, and it's, gonna take, it's gonna take a lot of effort by all of us. Uh, but together we, we can make change happen. And um, that's the way I think you're gonna see it. How do we guarantee that it'll never happen again? I wish I, I wish we could do that. I, I really wish I could say that these things, I, I, I will be honest. Uh, I've said this earlier this week is that I thought, you know, 20, you know, I'm now 55. I thought, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we would never be where we are today. I thought a lot of this would be over and we'd be in a much better place. And to see that the progress has been so slow that I start looking now and realizing that I won't see it in my lifetime. I won't see what I wanna see in my lifetime, but I certainly hope we can accelerate it here at UCF and that we can see it in a reasonable amount of time that we see substantial change in this community. But it's gonna take people like you engaging, being part of this. It's gonna take people like everybody who's here on this webinar. And I, I so appreciate the fact that we've heard it multiple times now. And so we have no way that we can say we're not doing that. We've heard multiple times these conversations have to continue and they will continue. And we need to do more of this because this is what's helpful to all of us. It's how we share our experiences, it's how we learn from each other and, um, and we'll, we'll continue to do this and we'll do more, we'll do more. Thank you. So I invite people to um, know where the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is. I don't even know that all of our students do know that, but we're located on campus at the Barbara Ewing Center and we have a multi-purpose room. And I want to use that space to have these types of dialogues. I see questions in the chat about that. Um, this is, for me, um, a serious thing. It's part of what I want to bring to us. And so there will be forums and other things where people can get together, but not just forums. I have task force in place right now, and we're looking at what we can do to make the systemic changes that are necessary on campus. I have a leadership council that I created that is helping support that. And so, again, um, how we roll out that information so people know we got to get better because obviously we didn't do a good job with that. But know that my presence here is not a token because I'm not going to allow myself to be a token. I'm here to do the work and I need you all to help me do that work. And I'm going to be your voice while I'm here doing that. And the university has known that and they accept that. I've been in boardrooms and in spaces saying these things and everybody doesn't know that. But I wanted to have this forum so that people can hear it from you all and support the fact that there is a need on this campus because a lot of people think that UCF was a utopia. They really did. And the news started coming out that, well, everybody don't feel that way. And so that is really important. So Andrew, thank you for bringing it. Other people, thank you for bringing it, Dr. Cartwright. Thank you for sharing your voice just now. And I don't know who's next because I don't see anyone on my screen, but um, I see Derisha Jones in here. So she's gonna be next, Derisha Jones. Can everyone see me? And here, can you hear me? One second. Yeah. Um, Dr. Teresa, you're there. We see you and we hear you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, my name is Darisha Jones. I am a current senior here on campus. My major is psychology. Um, today, I'm here to speak for the voice of the Black students at UCF. So 
we're angry, to be honest. Um, we're irritated. This is an this is a conversation that we've had in our communities for years. We have meeting after meeting bi-weekly in the Black Student Union, in the NAACP, in the Caribbean Students Association, in the African Students Association about these very issues that we're facing every single day. And now all of a sudden when there are protests, when there's riots, now we can have a conversation with our university about it. We are facing these issues every day when we're going to class and when we're going to work. And we have to be silent at those places because there's no one there to have that conversation with us. At UCF, we need to have an active voice of anti-racism, as you stated in your email. An active voice, starting that conversation with me. I shouldn't have to go to my supervisor and tell her, oh, I'm okay, when on the news you just seen George Floyd was killed by a police officer. I shouldn't have to start that conversation. It shouldn't take three days, four days to send out an email consoling the Black students at UCF. It shouldn't take that. Um, I have had forums with our police department on campus and we've had our uh, conversations about the police brutality and th they kind of ignore us, they blew, they blew us off. And it's true, they had, and I don't remember the officers' names completely, but they let us know that if we were black students that are not doing anything wrong, we have nothing to worry about. Well, that's not true. Um, UCF needs to be more anti-racist. On top of that, I have another note here. Um, we've had our forums, we've had our panels. I heard someone come in earlier and saying they need to call on the black students. The black students have been here. We've been here. I'm the, I was the president of the NAACP. I was a part of the NAACP for four years. Um, Black Student Union is the same thing. We've been here. We just need everyone else to join the board. We're tired of preaching to the choir. All of our meetings, we talk about racism. We talk about prejudice. We talk about our um, people are stereotyping us. We talk about these things, but no one seems to, no other race seems to be there to listen. The Black Student Union is the voice of Black students. Every other student is allowed to get in there and listen and to learn. Twitter, I'm not sure if um, all of the people on this panel have been on Twitter, but the black students are in an uproar about everything that has been happening besides the CARES Act. Um, we've been in an uproar about protesting. We are active in our community. All of us have been out there on the main lines with our signs peacefully protesting. That is not really said on the news. The black students have been peacefully protesting. We are not out here looting and ruining our Orlando community because we care about our Orlando community. Um, my next point is that um, UCF is always having conversations. We're always talking about action, but we need actual implementation. We need it to happen. I find that sometimes ideas are raised, there's an uproar, we have a meeting like this about it, and then it dies down and then nothing else has changed. I would like to see a plan of action. I would like to see who is responsible for implementing this plan of action, and then I would like to see it fulfilled. So that Thank is Thank you, Teresa. Thank you much. Um, appreciate you. Thank you. And, uh, well, I know Teresa, so I, I um, <laughs> move on to if anyone would like to respond um C christina go hi darisha um so <laughs> i'm really glad to be here especially as a student representative um just because i think it's so important that we have this conversation of course things are brought up and these remarks are made but more so making sure that of course it's implemented and that action is actually taken <laughs> Um, I think in connecting with Dr. Butler, I really want to have an active role in making sure that we have that accountability and more so that the things that are being posed and all the issues that we've been experiencing as Black students, Latino students, queer students, LGBTQ plus students, and so many different identifications that we have on this campus are recognized, heard, and taken seriously. Um, there's so many different things, especially going on right now, and to everyone who is protesting peacefully and really advocating for all that is happening, it's incredible to see. Um, I haven't been able to personally, physically, just because I am taking full care of family members who are impacted by the coronavirus. But with all that being said, I think it's especially important that within student groups that we have in OSI and student government and so many other agencies that are supposed to be inclusive in representing everyone that we actually have that. Um, in seeing with Senate, for example, someone mentioned earlier that there are a bunch of seats that were empty it's time that student government as a whole and so many other groups actually advocate, reach out to students and really take the stance and the initiative to make sure that we're actually reaching out to people and not just filling a quota. Um, and I can say that especially having served as a senator in student government, 
it's it's an issue, you know, being one of, I believe at the time it was one of four or five senators of color. Um, and then being a woman of color at that too, it really is something that needs to be better handled. Um, it is something that is more at the student level, I'd say, but I think administration can definitely have help with that level. And so again, I do want to be here to help facilitate that as well. And really, I've been taking notes as well. So from if you've noticed, I've been looking down, it's because of that. So that in the conversations that follow and really making sure that this isn't just a blanketed conversation that just goes away after a week and then we just continue going on with life as it was before, which we all know isn't even possible to happen. Um, I definitely wanna make sure that I myself am taking that responsibility and ensuring that we're doing all that we can for all Thank students, you. not just us black students, not just students who may be in the LGBTQ plus community or any other community, but ensuring that everyone administration comes together and really does have that unification, that voice and really represents the diversity, inclusion, opportunity, equity, and all the different things that we're really trying to embody our ca campus in. Thank you. Thank you both. And so we're gonna move on because we're getting really close on time. And so I would like um, Captain Metzger to speak. He wanted to share some things. I just wanted to respond that I'm disappointed that um, that our student felt that she was blown off by the police department. Yeah, you know, we try very hard to build relationships, and um, if we didn't build that relationship, then we failed. So, uh, in the future, we're going to strive to do better. And certainly, I'd like to reach out to some of our speakers today to get their help in making things better on campus, uh, because you know I've, I've been grateful to be able to listen and learn. Um, and I'd like the help of our students to make things better. Um, and we just rolled out a website today on transparency at the police department, um, at all of your UCF police department. We're here for you. And it's um, ucf.edu slash safety slash police transparency. And you can learn all about us and what we're doing. And we have action items on there um, that we've developed. Uh, there are blank spaces. We want to fill in those blank spaces with input from our students, from our faculty, from our staff. So help us serve you better. Uh, that's what I wanted to get out there, Kent. We have, thank you. Summer Mack next. Summer, come on on. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Summer Mack and I'm a sophomore at UCF and Emerging Media. And I just wanted to address how you guys are handling um, or how we can better improve our conditions for incoming freshmen or black people who are looking for the opportunity to attend these universities, but they aren't getting the chance because um, we have a flawed education system starting in high school where we have to take the SAT and ACT and these universities such as UCF are looking at our SAT ACT scores and I know when I went to enroll um, I was waitlisted and I wanted to know why and they said it's because I had low SAT scores. However, the SAT and the ACT are no different than the literacy tests that black people had to take in order to vote. So I'm wondering why the SAT, ACT scores are looked at so heavily when it comes to admissions because they're against black people, they're flawed. The SAT, or for example, the ACT, you don't have resource, free resources like Khan Academy. So it's harder for people to take the ACT, but it is statistically proven that black people do better on the ACT than on the SAT. Also, schools don't offer ACT testing for free like they do for the SAT, and you don't get free tutoring or anything like that. You have to pay to send your ACT scores, which is why I ended up only submitting my SAT scores, because it was free for me to submit my SAT scores, but then when you're told that you have low scores, so you, you're waitlisted or you can't get into the university that you want to go to, and school systems are trying to promote Black people being in schools, or these racists like Neji are saying that, um, if only black people were staying in schools and being better students like white people or Asian Americans. And that's just not true because the school system isn't trying to keep us in schools when you have to look so closely at scores instead of looking at our achievements. I made it through the IB program 
but my test scores hadn't come out by then. So whereas I had all of these accomplishments, I worked really hard to try and get to school. It was uncertain whether I was gonna get to go or not just because of SAT, ACT scores. So I wanna know how, and also with Bright Futures, Bright Futures heavily depends on that. And right. it's more difficult for black people to be able to go to college and- um, Summer, if I may. Yes. I, we will make sure that we look into it, the financial aid, the admissions office, you have just made it very clear that this is an issue that we need to take on. And so I appreciate that. And uh, again, keep us honest. And it's, it's when we hear voices like yours talking about what the needs are, we can move forward. And so I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bishop, Dr. Butler, I know it's late. Can I make one comment about that? Sure. We know that test scores are not a very good predictor of college success. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not as good a uh, predictor as exactly what you described, which is success in high school. We know that high schools are very different around the country and around the state, and students start out with different opportunities. The short answer for why we use test scores is that the state requires us to, a requirement that a good many universities are trying to get changed. And I hope you lift your voice there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And Naset Falu, you're next. You. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this forum. Um, uh, just, I know we only have uh, just very little time. So, um, um, how how are we to um, even think about how we're healing? This is not just about COVID. This is not just about including the trauma through George Floyd's in, uh, um, um, recent events and his death um, and, and, um, and everything else, but also even last year, right? With our Latinx students going through and black students and the rest of the world going through the massive deportation, children, um, sexual abuse, thousands of them right through ICE. So my point is when faculty teach race, racism, issues of ethnicity, it is a big responsibility. It is a level of competency, right? So if we're looking to see how we have, how as an institution, it has been overlooked the, not just the competency level of this faculty, um, but also through the trauma that students relive and experience in his classroom. So I have three quick points um, I just would like us to think about. First is um, the outcome of Nagy, um, and this is on behalf of students that I wanna say this, because um, they should know that lots of faculty are also behind them um, in this matter right now. Um, this is also his outcome, his fate is dependent on how the institution reconciles with the missed, numerous missed opportunities to, to be in heard in the past as they are openly expressing now, right? And to the second point, point right? Um, we should not look at their action as divisive, their petitions, their emails, their calls, their yelling, their screaming. You know, it is student activism, right? It is social action that is not new, but UCF needs to value it, right? Because it is a response. And like any other response to not being heard for a very long time, having these experiences in the classroom um, and so forth and so on. The demand is there, but we cannot look at that as devices. So I just want to, that's the, the second thing. And the third thing is, what are we constituting as evidence? I just want to ask that as we're asking students to come forward, that we're mindful of how students are reliving their experiences, particularly if they've already shared and those have not been heard in the past, um, how are they reliving those experiences as they re-report again or, or report again? And so, again, amidst so many layers that the entire world is dealing with to heal, um, 
there has to be in addition to what you publicly express and Dr. Ken Butler, this does not all fall on you for the peak sake, right? Like really, we have to make sure that it doesn't all fall on you, but it ought to not, right? I mean, all, the leadership are here showing us that they are engaged um, as, as well, but this cannot fall on the office of diversity and inclusion, right? The strategies developed for the future are important, but in this current moment, um, the demand and response that students are asking for needs to not just be a collaboration, but needs to be grounded in evidence that does not just fall on students in the current moment. So however that is, I'm happy to you know, talk about it, but I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, and I appreciate you very, very much. And um, you're right, and I think I did use the word divisive. I personally used that word, and I did, and when I'm hearing you say that, that's not my, that, Again, hear my heart and not my my ass. No, yes, no, yes, I am. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, I can't have people coming for me. I need to have you all working with me. And that's really what I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. So we have one more person that we're going to bring in. And uh, yes, we're going to bring one more person in now. Savannah Dawson Hamilton, the floor is yours. Oh, oh, hi, <laughs> it's working. Hello. Hello. How are okay, you? I just like to let just be started to say I'm really nervous. So excuse me if I'm stuttering all. Okay. So my experience with UCF. So I discovered a school about a few years ago and I was super excited to come here. I did the college tour way back in October and I was like, wow, I'm so ready to come here make some friends. We're right by Disney. This is the best school ever. <laughs> so as you know, I start in the fall. I'm a freshman starting in the fall and um, to be completely honest with the situation going on with Mr. Nagy, whatever his name is, has really made me lose a lot of faith in the school and I haven't even started yet. So I feel like that's a huge problem. And especially from how UCF was trending on Twitter the other day and how all these people are saying, wow, why are the faculty, faculty excuse me, allowing this professor to keep on leap, being at the school despite making all these racist comments also made me feel slightly ashamed that I already committed to the school and I'm going there, that I'm going to the school who allows such prejudice to keep on going. I understand that you guys are, your hands are tied because you know the law is pretty tricky, but at the same time, you just can't help but think, what, what, what's going on? And also I've noticed on Twitter, you know, recently a lot of Twitter super sleuths have been finding the students who have said a lot of racist, racist posts on the internet and immediately reporting them and then their school, whatever, um, brings down a hammer essentially. Like justice is swift and it's with a quickness. But it makes me wonder, why is that not the same with faculty and staff? Like if I were to go on Twitter just now and say the exact same things Mr. Nagy has been saying, I know for a fact that I, my admissions, my scholarships, my Pegasus scholarships will be pulled immediately and I would not be going to UCF. But why is that not, just not the same with Mr. Nagy? Like we students are paying UCF to go to the school, but we are being held more accountable than those that UCF is paying to work there. So I'm just like, what's going on? I feel like my voice as a student is slightly lower than faculty despite. <sighs> I'm so confused. Please help. So, Savannah, you're not confused, and thank you for sharing your 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 spirit. And we're hoping that when you do come to UCF, it is a place that you can be proud of, and, and that because we, we're going to do the work. Okay. Right now, you know, I know this is the first time we did this forum, and it sounds like it's in response to what's been going on, and it is because we really wanted to check in, do mm -hmm. a temperature check with people to see how they're doing. Um, I really wanted to do this um, in this format so that it wasn't us just talking back at you and you hearing it and, and hearing those messages that seem to be blanketed because um, you don't know us. And, and, and we do want you to know us and we do want you to trust us, right? That's the, really the spirit in it all. So I thank you for that. And I saw that Michael Johnson wanted to say something I think last time. So I'll, I'll turn it to him and then we're gonna close out. So Savannah, thank you very much. And when we're back on campus, we hope to see you. But even yeah. 
reach out if you yeah need. i mean i have faith like i just met all of you so i have some faith that you guys are going to do the right thing and handle the situation properly but at the same time you guys have really taken some bad steps so far so i hope you guys go in the right direction so yeah accountability thank you accountability yep I would say accountability and shining a bright light where it needs to shine. Mm -hmm. We've got a bright light shining on some things we're not happy about, not proud of at the university this week. But I think without that light, change can't come. So mm -hmm. thank you all who are here today. And thank you, everybody who, who helps us see our flaws. So we are coming to the end of this. And I really, truly appreciate all of you. Um, Dr. Cartwright, is there anything that you'd like to say before we close out? Um, I, I just reiterate what the provost said. I mean, this is this was incredibly valuable. We need the only way you can get better is to know where you are, uh, know where you are, know what you have to do. And uh, we, the administration, have a lot of work we need to do, and we need to look at a lot of our processes. We need to see how we're better supporting. We need. Uh, to think about what it is that our, our faculty responsibilities are and how we hold everybody accountable, faculty, administrators, staff, everybody, because this is about making sure that you have the environment for certainly for the students and for our staff and our faculty and our administrators, that they have the environment where they feel that they belong and that is their home. So thank you. And I look forward to us having additional conversations like this. So we're coming up on the end of time and we can't answer every question that was being asked and we're gonna to try to in, our, in, in the best that we can. I will share with you that I'm trying to have these forms. We're gonna work out when they're gonna be able to be on, but in the next week or so, we'll have more of a, a planned schedule of what these are gonna look like. But while we're in COVID and, and not on campus, we're gonna to try to do this this way um, when we're back on campus, I promise you that we're going to have forums and times for people to come together and talk. Because I think that people in their terms of healing need to be with others and to be able to talk and to share and to hear themselves and to be heard when they are sharing their stories. Um, I'm a truly firm believer in hearing people's narratives and letting them sow into my life. And so as your diversity and inclusion officer, I'm here to try to do all I can to make sure that this is a very inclusive environment. I, as the young lady said later earlier, um, I can't do it alone. And uh, in this work, just know that my heart's in the right place. I may not always say what you want me to say, but my heart is in the right place and I'm trying to do the right thing. And, uh, and I'm learning, I learn every day. Words matter. The university is learning, words matter action matters. We're going to do what we can. And uh, I, God bless you all. And thank you for your time. Um, we're going to close out this, this event now. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.